When the rock was rolled away, he lived forevermore in his eternal home. No, you can't keep a good man down, crosses and stones. No, you can't keep a good man down, crosses and stones.
Federal Broadcasting Network, your home for the best in Southern gospel music. Strength, the number four today.com, and on the TuneIn app, Eternal Broadcasting Network, a ministry of Timberlake Baptist Church. Yesterday, today, and forever. Good evening, welcome to Timberlake Baptist Church and our Sunday evening service. Hope all of you had a blessed day. Glad that you joined us this evening, whether it be whether Facebook or Eternal Broadcasting. We just appreciate you being with us. Uh, tonight we're going to kick off with our precept. It comes from Isaiah 58, 11. If you got your bulletin, you can read it along. It says, And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat the bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring water, whose waters fail not. Verse 12, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of paths to dwell in. Let's open up in a word of prayer and cover the prayer list. Dear precious Father, we just thank you for your many blessings, Lord. We just thank you for your love and your grace. Lord, we just thank you for this evening, Lord. Lord, we just thank you that no matter what's going on in this world, we can still gather around your word, Lord, and still dig into your word, Lord, just draw closer to you. Lord, we ask tonight, Lord, that you be with the songs, be with the message, Lord, anoint the pastor from on high, Lord, just give him the message. Lord, we ask tonight, Lord, that you start preparing hearts for that message, Lord. Lord, we ask that you be with our prayer list, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, knowing that we can lay these needs at your feet, and that you're going to meet each and every one of these needs. Uh, we ask you to be with Beverly Keen, recovering from cellulitis, Amy Grafton and her chemo treatments, Carol Tickle and her back, Virginia Hines and Diane Mills, Carl Stamer and his health. Uh, I ask you to reach down and touch Audrey Hoskins. I'll uh, be with Paul Forrest and his congested heart failure. I'll uh, be with Shelly Reichert uh, dealing with this COVID-19 and wife on the uh, mission field in China. Uh, continue to be with Sarah, Lord, just touch her body. I'll uh, be with Jamie Cole and the also on his foot. Also Shirley Taylor and her upcoming back surgery. Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, we just thank you for continuing to bless, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for dying on that old rugged cross for our soul. It's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Tonight we're going to kick off with a song from the Inspirations. I've got more to go to heaven for. center of God's will. I've watched the angels come and take my love from for the state. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. There's a golden street to walk upon, a bell I'm going to ring. A brand new angel in the choir, I want to hear her sing. Well, I'm going to read 
got you both and still let's uh look at them we got a few announcements um we need to be in prayer lord for our calendar of events that all this goes away and we can uh pick up where we left off and get involved so still mark your calendars for the events on there uh also if you missed the message this morning on the on the last part of the three attributes of god you need to go back and watch that you missed the blessings um also tonight We'll be doing uh, Reconciling with the Truth About Sin. Um, now we're going to read the prayer for the day. Lord, help me this day to realize that every soul is eternal and every soul needs redeeming by the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to view everybody the same and seek them out and just seek to share Jesus with everyone we pass, everyone you see, or even everyone that you cross paths on Facebook. Um, if you got your Bibles, while you, next, before we play the next song, if you want to go ahead and get those out and turn to Ezekiel chapter 36 um, and 31, that's where we'll be at tonight. Now we want you to enjoy this song by the Hoppers. Jesus, you must make, Jesus, you just made my day. I woke up this morning and walked out my door. A new day was dawning. Okay, now we're going to get to the offering portion of our wild online Sunday night services. Um, it does look like that everything is probably going to be the same in a couple of weeks, which is Mother's Day. And I want to go ahead and start offering um, what we're going to be doing for Mother's Day uh, this coming year. We're going to do something very similar as we did with Easter, uh, a 20 to 30 second video clip that you send to me. And we want it to uh, be a, a tribute to, a shout out to your mother. But also, we want you to add a verse that summarizes or reminds you of your mother. Maybe it's her favorite verse, or maybe it's a description of her, or something else like that. Either way, um, keep it around 20 to 30 seconds. I've had them between 12 and 7 minutes, uh, 12 seconds and 7 minutes so far. So try to keep it between 20 and 30 seconds, and we'll do our best to make sure that we get it on there. Make sure that it has a, a Bible verse with it, so that way we can um, have that as well with the, uh, the video. I want to thank everyone for continuing uh, to give your support to Timberlake Baptist Church. 
If you haven't done so already, or if it's this, your turn this week, remind you to send your checks to Timberlake Baptist Church, P.O. Box 10,004, Danville, Virginia, 24543. And also, it's available online. Well, I've noticed a lot of uh, pickup of, of you people using the online, and just get, keep in mind it's totally safe, and it's um, secure, and it should be um, pretty handy for you. And uh, that's on our website, strengthnumber4today.com. You can use that at any time. And so you, do, you don't have to do it while we're here or anything else like this. You can do it wee hours of the morning, late at night, uh, whichever time is, suits you best. Just go ahead and, and use that at whatever time. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pray for our offering. And then after this, we'll be watching a video from the Perry Sisters, More Than Just a Hill. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for the privilege and honor that it is to worship you. We're thankful, Lord, for the answers of prayer that you've given us, Lord, and just ask that you would just watch over and protect us during these uh, very unique times that we're in right now. I pray, Lord, for healing for our nation. I pray for healing for everyone that's sick. And I pray, Lord, that uh, normal living would, uh, would, would return very quickly. I ask God that you would just bless our offering, bless the giver and the gift and the giver. May it go to further your kingdom. All these things we ask in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen.
And that's the Perry sisters. And when he made Calvary, it was more than just a hill. Thanks for joining us tonight. Take your Bibles and turn to Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 31. We're going to begin a new series of messages that will last tonight, Sunday morning and Sunday night, on reconciling the, with the truth about your sin. I hope young people are watching this message. If you have a young person and, and you hear this message tonight, get them to go back and listen to it again on uh, Facebook or uh, YouTube, whatever the opportunity avails them. Get them to listen to this message because this is a time-sensitive message for the world that we're living in today. The world we live in today scoffs and mocks at the concept of sin. They deny sin exists. Today we live in a society where people believe that live and not live. If you want to be a homosexual or a lesbian, be so. If you want to be a drunkard, be so. If you want to be a drug addict, be so. If you want to gamble, be so. If you want to lie, lie on. Just don't bother me. Live and let live. That's the society we live in today, but that's not the society God wants his children to live in. The Bible makes it clear that sin is a reality of life. And it has been a reality of life since the Garden of Eden when the snake tempted Eve and Adam willingly sinned and did wrong in the eyes of God. The word sin in the King James Bible is there in some form some 630 times. The word sin is the description of an action against God's word, a breaking of the commandments of God, the principles of God, the precepts of God. The word sin is the description of that. Romans chapter 6 verse 12 says this, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. That's a command. That you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, resurrected by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and saved by his grace and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Very clearly, sin is not to be a part of the life of the child of God. We're to strive to be righteous and holy, not to be better than other people, but to be a vessel of honor to God so that God can reach through our lives to the lives of other people. The word wicked is another form of the word sin. And it's found in the King James Bible some 471 times. The word wicked is the way God views the actions of sin in his view of judgment. So God will declare someone wicked who commits sin. Wickedness is, is horrible in the eyes of God. I want to share three verses with you about wickedness. First of all, Psalm 145 verse 20. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. That's plain scripture. God will destroy those who are wicked. Psalm 7 verse 11. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. So God not only judges wickedness, he's angry at it in the life of a Christian. He's angry at wickedness. He doesn't want it to be a part of our lives. He doesn't want us committing sin to the point he can describe us as wicked people. Psalms chapter 5 verse 4. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. So God doesn't want wickedness in his presence. And he doesn't want wickedness in your presence. Wickedness is to be removed from our lives. Then there's the word abomination. The word abomination is in the King James Bible 154 times. The word abomination is the way God sees sin and his uh, reaction to sin. He turns from it. He winces at it. Some have even said he holds his nose and gags when he sees sin in your life and in my life. 
The Bible says in Deuteronomy 25, 16, for all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination, a stench in the nostrils of God, an abomination unto the Lord thy God. When you sin, you make God sick. That's what the Bible says. It makes God literally, violently ill when you sin. It makes him upset. Then the Bible says in Luke 16, 14, and the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things. And they derided him, being Jesus. And he said, Jesus said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God, as we preach this morning, knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Does that not uh, describe America and the world we're living in today? I have to be honest with you. Wendy and I stopped at the post office on one day this week to get the mail. And there come this girl out of the post office with another lady, and she had a rainbow on her t-shirt. And of course, when I see a rainbow, I think of the promises of God. When the world sees a rainbow, it says do what you want to and live like you want to and live like a heathen, live like a homosexual or a lesbian. And when she come out, this, this church said this, Blessed, I am blessed. And she's holding hands with another woman walking down the sidewalk. My dear, I want you to know you're not blessed. You're not blessed. You're deceived. You're deceived by the devil. You're deceived by the lies of this world that you think you're wrong is right. I want to tell you we're in a mess in this world we're in today. We're in a mess in Danville, Virginia. We're in a mess in the state of Virginia. We're a mess in the country of the United States of America because we no longer view sin as sin, wickedness, or an abomination. We've stopped viewing the reality of sin. Then there's a fourth word, the word iniquity. It's in the King James Version in several forms, some 334 times you find the word iniquity in the King James Bible. The word iniquity deals with where sin originates in man's heart. And if he surrenders to the temptation, what damage that iniquity, that sin does to his body, spirit, and soul when he commits it. When you see the word iniquity, it's talking about the damage that's done on the inside. The damage that's done to the mind and the thought process. Because let me tell you what's going to happen. Because man gets away with sin once, he thinks he can do it again. And again, and again, because judgment is not executed speedily. They think they can do it over and over and get away, and it's okay, because, hey, nothing happened, I'm all right. That's the devil's deception. That's the devil's, that he's using the mercy of God to his benefit and causing you to fall deeper and deeper and twist your mind, your heart, and your soul to commit that iniquity that starts in your heart and then ends up in a physical act of sin. The Bible says in Ezekiel 28, verse 15, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Talking about the devil himself. But then it says, Till iniquity was found in thee. Iniquity started with Satan, but it spread to this world that we're in. There is something more contagious than the coronavirus. It's called iniquity. It's called sin, and it's a contagious, wicked thing. The, all I have just shared with you proves the Bible in one of four forms speaks about sin 1,589 times. It talks about sin, it talks about wickedness, abomination, and it talks about iniquity. I think I just proved you from the Word of God, from the King James Bible, God is very concerned about sin. Let me tell you how concerned He is about sin. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. A Savior is someone who saves you from something. Well, what does Jesus save you from? The Bible makes it clear He saves you from sin. 
and the effects of sin and the wages of sin, which is death. Sin is a horrible thing. We've got to go back as Christians to calling sin, sin, or we're going to be ineffective in winning the loss for Christ. The world wants you to ignore sin. Don't call it sin. But God wants you to deal with your sin, first of all, by getting saved. And then deal with it as a Christian by letting the Holy Spirit lead you instead of letting your flesh lead you, as we talked about this morning. If you don't deal with your sin, I promise you one thing before God tonight. If you don't deal with your sin, your sin will deal with you. Your sin will come back to haunt you. Sin in the Hebrew is the word katawa, katal, an offense, sometimes an habitual sinfulness, and its penalty, an offender, the punishment of sin, sin or sinner. Then the Greek word for sin is hamatari, a sin, an offense, a sinful act. So whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, the word for sin, guess what, is still sin. It's an offense to God. It's a disobedience to God. You can deny that sin is sin, but it still separates you from God when you commit it. You can deny it's there, but if you commit a sin, there's a, listen, first of all, if you're lost, you're, you're, you're not saved to start with, and it's going to send you to hell because you didn't choose Jesus to take care of your sin bed. If you are saved, every time you sin, you put a, a wall between you and God that has to be removed by 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You have to, as a Christian, deal with your sin every day and keep your slate clean before God. Not to go to heaven, but to be able to serve God and live for Him and be close to Him. We ought to want to be close to God. We ought to want to be in conversation with our prayer. We ought to want to hear from Him from the Word of God. We ought to want to be able to reach out to other people with the gospel and see them saved. Sin halts all that. It's still a danger even to the child of God after he's saved. And folks, you can deny it, but when you commit a sin, it still puts a separation between you and God. And I want to share a second thought with you. God says sin is wrong, absolutely wrong. And when you commit sin, you're defying a righteous and a holy God. People are so offended today when you call their sin, sin. I want to tell you something. Brother Scott Dean, just a while back, stood up in front of the council in Greenville, South Carolina, to stand up for the traditional family. And a group of homosexuals and lesbians stood up and booed him right there in the city council. Why? Because the world doesn't want to hear that sin is sin. I don't care if it's drinking, gambling, lying, adultery, I don't care what it is, people don't want to hear about their sin anymore. They want to have their sin and have their Savior, and it's not possible that that can happen. It's not possible that that can be. Because sin, first of all, if you're lost, separates you from God eternally. If you're saved, it separates you temporarily from God so that you can't serve him. It cripples you as a child of God. And so when you sin... You're flaunting your fist in the face of God saying, God, you're not smarter than I am. God, I know more than you know. I'm afraid you're wrong. God knows everything. He's God. You can deny it. You can defy God. People call sin an alternate lifestyle. No sin is an op not an option. God says it's wrong, period. And folks, number three, you can ignore sin, but it still does it's devastating work. What blows my mind is people say, my sin's not sin, I'm going to enjoy it. But when the bill is rung up and payday is due and your chickens come home to roost, all of a sudden then you want deliverance and then most of the time it's too late. I'll, I'll never forget. I've stood by so many bedsides of so many Christians who are saved. But they decided that, you know, smoking wasn't wrong. Their cigarette problem wasn't wrong. 
But it's mighty afraid how they're on their deathbed crying out for another breath. But the cigarettes they've smoked for 40 years has took their breath away. It's still sin. Your chickens come home to roost. Hey, I'm not, I'm not avoided on that one. I laid in the hospital for 10 days because my chickens come home to roost. You can't do what you want to and eat what you want to and live like you want to and live to talk about it. It will kill you. Be sure your sin will find you out. There is a cost to sin. And when you commit sin, you may think you're getting away with it, but it's doing this devastating work undercover. And it comes back to bite you. And it comes back to take you away. And it takes away the blessed thing that God bought for you, your new life in Christ. Christians, when you go back to the pig pen, and you go back to sin, it, it robs you of the new life, the miraculous life, the joyful life, the powerful life that Christ has for you. It robs you of it. You can ignore it, but it's still going to do its work. The Bible is clear. There has never been a human other than Jesus Christ that has not committed sin. We all commit sin. You're either a lost sinner or a sinner saved by grace. But everybody's fighting sin. I don't care who you are. And a man will never see his need to be a savior if you don't preach against sin. That's the goal of the devil. He's trying to silence the preachers. The state of Virginia and other states are trying to silence us from saying sin, sin. And that's the devil's goal because if we can't preach against sin, they'll never see the need of a savior. Never see their need of a savior. If you want to be a lying, cheating, gambling, drinking, drugging, adultering, homosexual, lesbian, that's your choice. Go at it, honey. I'm just trying to warn you it's going to cost you at the end of the road. There's a payday coming. I'm just trying to help you. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not here to stop you from doing what you want to do. That's your choice. That's your option. You have the right as an American citizen to live any way you want to. But I got the right as an American citizen to tell you it's wrong and try to warn you and help you before you hit a train wreck. Everybody wants to cuss the preacher, hate the preacher, silence the preacher until they're in the hospital or the funeral home. And honey, it's too late when we get there. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Nobody wants the preacher to help them now. But when they fall off the wall, please, preacher, please put us back together. It's too late. It's too late once you fell off the wall. I can't put you back together. God might can, but hey, it's just like the fellow who said, I'll get saved on my deathbed, preacher. He told the preacher, he said, he was a railroad man. He said, when I, when I get close to dying, I'll take care of it then. But right now, I've got too much living to do. A month later, he got on the train, was going down a hill, lost brakes, train wreck. He died. He died four days later, scalded to death. Scalded to death right there in the train wreck. And the people standing by his bed could hear him squealing, screaming, I can't stop. I'm burning up. I can't stop. I'm on fire. I can't stop. The preacher come in, tried to witness to him. He couldn't get through to him. His wife tried to witness to him. She couldn't get through to him. He's screaming, and all of a sudden, he stopped breathing, and he died. But he had a chance a few weeks before when the preacher was there trying to help him come to know Christ. But it was too late. You won't get saved when you want to. I got news for you. You'll get saved when God calls you. You won't get saved at all. That's a fact. You better come while he's calling. You better come while it's offered. You better stop trying to silence the preacher, and you better start listening to him. I don't care if you're the governor. I don't care if you're a senator. I don't care if you're a mayor. I don't care who you are. You better let the preachers preach the truth and give people a chance to be saved. That's the fact of the word of God. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, verse 23 says. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet is preaching to Israel, but he could have been preaching to America this day and this hour. 
Ezekiel clearly describes and defines the character of sin. To, for the rest of this message tonight, Sunday morning and Sunday night of next week, if they haven't locked me up and put me in jail, which they might, I'll finish these two messages. The Bible says in Ezekiel 36, 31, Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Isn't it amazing how many of those words in that one verse that I've talked to you about? All there in that one scripture. Tonight let's talk about remembering your sin. 31a says, then, <laughs> that word then means too late. Too late. Then shall you remember your own evil ways. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time, not when it's too late. Now, one of the results and curses of committing sin is the memory of it. I know things I did when I was a kid, things I did when I was a teenager, they still haunt me to this day because I can't forget them. Now, God's forgiven me. God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. And I can't forget. God can, but I can't forget the things that I've done. And those sins still haunt me to this day, and your sins still haunt you to this day. The best thing to do is not commit them so you don't have to remember them. Amen or amen. Many people try to avoid their own sins and distract others from seeing their sin by gossiping or criticizing others for their sin. I can't deal with your sin, you can't deal with mine, but you better deal with yours. And I better deal with mine or we're going to remember them. We're going to remember them for a long time. Eventually in the darkness of the lonely hours of life of night, your sins will rise up and disrupt your life and the memory will haunt your conscience. But thank God when we get to heaven, we won't remember them anymore. But right now, sins haunt your memory. That's why you need the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you what will help you. The more you study the Word of God, the more you pray, and the more you serve God, it helps you forget those old things from the past because you've got so many things going on good in the future. We've got to invest our time, talent, and treasure in study, prayer, and serving God. That helps keep our mind clear. That renews our mind. I talked to you about that the other day. Folks, I want to share several thoughts. First of all, the memory of sin tempts you. The memory of sin tempts you to do it again and do it over and repeat the same mistake over and over and over again. Many people, instead of dealing with their sin and repenting of it, they just jump and delve right back into it headlong and wholeheartedly. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, but it has happened again unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow hath washed to, uh, wa uh, washed to her wallowing in the mire. Folks, a dog has no interest in anybody but himself. Let me tell you something. That dog at my house, that Dobrin at my house, my son's dog, he, uh, she only thinks of herself. Now, Brandon likes to think that she worships him. Wendy likes to think that he works, she worships her. But that dog worships whoever feeds it. That dog worships whoever lets it in and out the door. I'm sitting on my bed getting dressed to come to church tonight, and she walks right by me with her nose up there. I thought she was a Baptist. I said, Charm. She never looked at me. Walked right in the bathroom where Wendy was. Went to where I went because she knew Wendy feeds her. Wendy lets her in and out. Walter ain't doing it. That's Wendy's job. That dog come back through. Nose up now. I said, charm. That thing had that nose up now. Never paid me a look of attention of mine at all. Wendy come back in the bedroom, and that dumb dog bowed down to her. I said, you sorry much, you. That dog's got no interest in nobody but himself. She cares about nobody but her. That's what the Bible's trying to teach us sinners the same way. A sinner doesn't care about God. A sinner don't care about his family. A sinner doesn't care about himself, just his flesh. People say, a man is dog's best friend. 
No, the dog knows how to manipulate you into pleasing him, and a dog is really looking out for his own best interest. Oh, I can hear you. Well, preacher, what about that dog that saves his master? That dog ain't dumb. If he don't save his master, he's going to die. The dog's not stupid. That dog's smart. Hey, the dog is manipulated to take care of himself. Folks, listen. He don't want to lose his free ride. The dog doesn't want to lose that meal ticket or his dry roost where he lives. You can give a pig a bath. You can perfume that pig. You can paint that pig's toenails. You can put a tutu on it, a little pink tutu on that little pig. You can put a bow on its head. You can go to the jeweler and buy a $10,000 gold ring put in its nose. Then you can buy a diamond studded collar and put that thing around that pig and prance that pig around, that thing look pretty. That thing will have bling bling and oh, it's trumping all over. But you turn that thing loose, you know where that thing's going right back to the mud hole. It don't care about your tutu. It don't care about your diamond ring. It don't care about your diamond studded collar or your toenails or the perfume you paid to put on that pig. That pig wants one thing, to wallow in the mud. And folks, when sin is all you care about, when having your sin in your way is all that matters to you, you're no better than a dog or a pig. That's what the Bible says. I'm offended, preacher. Well, be offended at God. It's what he said. It's not what I said. God's just trying to help you wake up and realize what the devil done to you. The devil's turned you into a dog or a pig. He wants you to be a child of the king. But you've got to give up sin. And man doesn't want to give up his sin. Oh, listen. As soon as you turn that pig loose, he's running back to the mud hole. And as soon as you turn a sinner loose, he's going right back to the, the drug alley, right back to the whorehouse. He's going right back to the uh, drinking place. He's going back to all those wicked places they ought not be. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11 is clear. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Seeing thou a man wise in his own conceit, there's more hope of a fool than of him. Preacher, I'm offended you said that. I didn't say that. God said that. The Lord said that. God tries to remind us of our sin in order to get us to repent of that sin. Yet instead of listening to God and surrendering to his convicting power through the word of God, we become conceited and we override his conviction and the word of God with our own opinion and our own attitude and our own wants. And God calls that folly which is simpler in terms, uh, is, a, is called silliness. We want our silliness more than we want our Savior. And it's destroying our churches. It's destroying our homes. It's destroying everything around us. Something silly is something of trivial or of no value. Something silly is meaningless or has, a, has no substantial value eternal validity. Something silly is pointless or has no destiny or future in it. We want to put our lives in sin. There's no future in sin. He that sinneth, the soul that sinneth, it shall die is what the Bible says. It'll die spiritually between them and God and die physically because of the sin. God says there's no hope for such a one who values his own opinion and his own wants and ways more than the truth of God's precious and holy and protective word. That is the reason the world is so degrading. It devalues and tries to destroy the credibility and the validity of the word of God. And the most precious thing this world has, it hates. And that's the Bible. We ought to love the word of God. And we try to deny it and throw it aside and ignore it when it's the greatest gift God ever gave man other than his son, Jesus Christ. If you don't say amen, I will. Oh, listen. When a man walks this road, God says all hope is gone. There's more hope for a brain-dead gimp than for a fool who said in his heart that he does not have to listen to God and he doesn't have to pay attention to God's convicting power. There's no hope for him. 
Folks, memory tempts you to sin. It tempts you to go back instead of going forward. B, the memory of sin turns us into inflamed and enraged reprobates to do worse than we've already done. Sin, the memory of sin turns you backwards to make you backslide. People say that you can lose your salvation. Well, then why did God put backsliding in the Word of God? Backsliding is not losing your salvation. It's going back to the pig pen. It's going back to the hog walla. It's going back to the vomit of the wickedness of life. The Bible, Jesus tells a story about a man who cleaned his house and he went back and come back and seven devils worse than was there came back when he turned back and came back. Let me tell you something. Turning over a new leaf doesn't do it. You've got to be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Then you've got to get in the Word of God on your knees and pray and stay close to God so that you don't turn back and go back to the wicked ways of this life. Romans 1.28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. Folks, what you do is what your mind thinks. What you remember and what you think is your mind. We need to put good memories of godly things in our mind and get rid of the bad memories. We need to renew our mind and transform it by the Word of God and the works of God and the way of God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 says, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by the way of remembrance. Folks, we have corrupt minds. Corrupt minds have sinful thoughts, but pure minds have godly thoughts. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Trusting and serving God is simple and has good results. But the devil tries to corrupt our thinking with his lies and his deceptions and his delusions and his complications in our life. And it complicates it with temptation and sin that distracts us from God's purpose and destroys the destiny God's plan for us. Yet that's the goal of the devil is to put sin back in the life of a Christian and derail the promises of God. Wake up, Christians, and smell the coffee. Stop following the delusions of Satan's drug of deception. Oh, listen to me. Look at what it did to Adam and Eve. Look at their failure and the future they had and the future we've had as a human race, all because they listened to the lies of the devil instead of the truths of God. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 8 says very clearly, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, not the memories of sin, not the past. Think about the present and the future. Think on the good things of God. Why? Because I'm going to tell you something today. The memory of sin turns you the wrong way. The memory of sin tempts you to do wrong. And finally, the memory of sin taunts you and shames us. All of us have got a past, and our past shames us. But the blood of Jesus frees us from that shame. Why would we want to go back and live that way again and fall back into that shame again when God's freed us and gave us a new life and a second chance and a new way to go? When people grow older, their past haunts them physically, psychologically, and in penitence, regret. They wish they could go back and undo the things they've done. They feel like they can never get over their past. I'll never forget sitting in my grandmother's living room years ago. She said, Walter, when I die, make sure they sing the song at my funeral, Wasted Days. Make sure they sing that because I've wasted my life. 
I spent my life making wrong decisions and doing wrong things, and I've paid a heavy price for wasted years, wasted years. Oh, how foolish. When she died, they sang that song at her funeral. She want her children, her grandchildren, no, don't waste your years, don't waste your life, don't be foolish. She could never get over some mistakes she made in her life. And she held them, she never told me what they were, and I didn't want to know. But I know they haunted her. And they made her cry. And they made her weep. And they made her sad. That's what happens when sin messes with your mind. Oh, thank God for the forgiveness of God. Job 8.22 says, They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. When I first became a pastor, I thought everybody hated me. Because when they see me coming, they run the other way. I bought new deodorant, I bought new aftershave, I did everything I could to make myself smell better, and I get my hair cut and comb it right and make me look better. I thought it was me. It wasn't me. It was who I stood for. They were playing with sin, living in sin. They were ashamed of the way they lived. When they saw me, they got under conviction. Don't worry about the preacher. The preacher's not going to hurt you. You better worry about standing before God. That's what's going to hurt you. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 5, A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. I'm trying to tell you tonight, playing with sin only embarrasses you. It's a fun for a little bit, but when it's over, it embarrasses you. You're ashamed of it. You're ashamed of what you've done, where you've been. Just don't do it, and there won't be any shame. Philippians 3.18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory, uh, whose, uh, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. I'm afraid most Christians, they are minding earthly things instead of heavenly things. Regret and remorse can take all the joy out of your salvation. And that's the devil's goal. And we, by God's help, have to win this battle of regret and shame. We have to be reminded daily of God's grace and God's strength and God's mercy, his forgiveness to get us over this stuff and, and to get us to a, uh, the new day and the new life in Christ and the life of victorious living. It's amazing how when you start living for God, you forget about the past. And God starts to use you and bless you and gives you a future worth living for. He starts creating a new testimony that's better than the old one because of the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities, and I remember them <laughs> no more. Thank God. I remember them, but God doesn't remember them anymore. And he's helping me forget them. And he'll help you forget them. He's helped me move forward. He'll help you move forward. Hebrews 10, 17, their ways are their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. Jeremiah 31, 34b, know the Lord. Get close to God. Pray. Read your Bible. Serve him. For they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The great message I got tonight is he's a forgiving God. You just come back home. He'll put a new heart in you. He'll take that old dog heart out. He'll take that old pig heart out. And he'll put a godly heart in you. And he'll help you be the Christian you ought to be. If you're lost, he'll save your old wicked soul. He'll give you the Holy Spirit and a new life in Christ. And your shame and regret will be gone today, tomorrow, and forever. If you just let him forgive you. He's a forgiven God. If you do not confess, repent, and forsake your sins, then you'll have to remember your sins. And they'll hamper you, hinder you, halt you, and haunt you, and in the end, they'll harm you when it's all said and done. I'm here tonight to tell you it doesn't have to end up that way. There's a better way. Oh, listen, I'll never forget. I had a friend of mine. Very, very wicked when he was young. But he got saved, started living for God. Got down to the end of his life. He grabbed this old preacher by the hand. 
And he said, I'm not afraid to die. My sins are forgiven. I've lived for God since he saved me. I've led people to Christ since he saved me. I've had help from the Holy Ghost not to go backwards since he saved me. And I got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. That song went by accident tonight. It was on purpose. Because we got more to go to heaven for than we had yesterday. Because he said, I will remember your sins no more. And all God's people said, Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You don't have to remember your sin. If you remember your sin, the memory of sin tempts you to do it again and again and repeat the same mistake. He can, he can change your memory. Remembering your sin turns you and turns us into inflamed and enraged reprobates that do worse than we did before. Doesn't have to be that way. Oh, we can stay close to Christ and have something worth living for. The memory of sin taunts you and sin shames you. I'm here to tell you a new life in Christ and a built testimony can take care of any past. I hear Christians all the time talk about how they used to be ashamed but no longer they're proud of their Savior because he forgave them. He forgot their sins. He's fortified them and strengthened them. He's been faithful to them. He's helped him, him, them to be faithful to him. And now they're bearing fruit for God because Christ gives a new life after you confess and forsake your sin. Repent of your sin and turn to Christ and be saved. And he'll give you a life worth living. If you're out there and you're not saved today, say, Preacher, I need to be saved from my sin. I realize I got sin now, and I need to do something about it. And the Father sent the Son to be the Savior, and I want him to pay my sin debt. I don't want to live in sin anymore. I don't want to live in sorrow and shame anymore and sickness and peril. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Won't you bow your head right where you are and pray this prayer silently while I pray it aloud. Say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again as payment of my sins. And the best I know how, I turn from sin to the Savior. And I ask Christ to save me right now. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Now, Lord, help me serve you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You ask, he did. Would you go to our website, www.strengththenumber4today.com? And would you go there and leave us a comment on the comment page? Leave us your address so we can send you a Bible and some books how to get started right and get new memories made, blessed memories, and a great testimony since the blood of Jesus Christ has saved your soul from sin. Christians, have you turned back because the memory of sin was so great because you weren't praying like you should? You weren't studying like you should? You weren't serving like you should? You started pleasing yourself instead of pleasing God? It's never too late to tell God you're sorry. It's never too late to claim 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whatever sin you've committed, just ask God to forgive you right now. And ask God to help you get turned back around on the right track and get those new memories started. Start watching God give you some eternal fruit that will last forever. Pleasure your sins just for a season. But the fruit you earn with God's help is eternal. Oh, listen, there's a God greater than the enemy, and he loves you, and he cares about you tonight. Father, take this little simple message I've tried to preach tonight and help people realize, Lord, from the depths of their heart, they do not have to remember their sins anymore. Lord, they have to remember the memory of sin tempts them. The memory of sin turns them the wrong way. The memory of sin taunts them. Lord, it shames them. But, Lord, your forgiveness frees them from all of that. And, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, you'll help every Christian watching by the Internet tonight. Lord, I pray you'll help them, Lord, to trust you more and to serve you more and bless them and help them to begin to make new memories and bear new fruit that's eternal and not temporal. Bless every listener. Bless your word tonight. Bless this church. Get us through this pandemic. Get us back on our feet. And back to winning the loss, for that's why we're here. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen.
Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, remember Wednesday night we got service live again at 7 o'clock. Uh, be sure to join us then. Let's dismiss in prayer. Dear President Father, we just thank you for your many blessings. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the truth. Lord, sometimes the truth's hard to swallow. Lord, but we just thank you, Lord, that we can lean on you, Lord, for understanding and knowledge. Lord, and wisdom. Lord, we ask you to just guide us. Be with each and every one that was listening, whether now or later. Lord, just bless them and their families, Lord. And Lord, most of all, Lord, there's one in our midst that, did, that don't know you as their Savior, Lord. Just don't let them lay their head down tonight without accepting you as their Savior. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.